so today, so the program of the week is the following. So I'm going to cover travel survey and data collection uh, for the first two days. And in particular, I'm going to talk about National Household Travel Survey, which is um, the main source of data uh, that I'm using now that I'm in the US. Um, this has changed a little bit from what I was used to do in, um, in Europe. Uh, tomorrow, it's going to be um, stated preference method. Um, and uh, Wednesday, uh, I would like to finish the um, discrete, dynamic discrete choice models uh, that we interrupted on Friday, uh, and then uh, give you an example uh, on how to use Biogym, which is, I think, uh, the most used software um, in uh, discrete choice modeling, uh, written by my friend Michel Birler in Switzerland. Um, uh, so uh, Michelle is also always looking for good students. If you, um, so we are all looking for good students. So if you want to know more about this, we are open to either uh, myself, my colleague in Montreal, and Michelle in Switzerland. Um, if you are, if you want to do an exchange project or do a PhD with us. Okay, so today is not modeling, but um, I think being able to collect data or to use data is as important as knowing about modeling. Uh, because data will give you idea, uh, ideas about um, travel behavior, how to model travel behavior, which is of interest in travel behavior. So you can be a good modeler. Uh, but at the same time, you need to know how to manipulate data, where to get the good data, and um, uh, how to use the data in order to get your model. Um, so this is a very, um, uh, there will be no formula here. It's just a description of what uh, a survey and how to use a survey. OK, so um, most of the, our work is based on data. And in particular, now we are interested uh, in, uh, trans in um, typical transportation data, but also in land use data. So now with GIS uh, and um, all kinds of um, uh, land use data, uh, what we can do with transportation model has expanded a lot. Um, so if you are not, so there are people in transportation who are just concerned about designing and conducting surveys. So I have a friend of mine who are just working in collecting data and um, designing data. Uh, I would say in my case, I would say 40% of my time is collecting data and 60% of my time is uh, um, uh, using data for modeling. Uh, but the, if you don't conduct a survey yourself, and if you not um, uh, design a survey yourself, it doesn't mean that you don't need to know about surveys. Because knowing about surveys will help you um, um, understand how to use data and what to do with this data, how to, to develop your own model. Um, so the other challenge is, um, um, is finding uh, and writing good documentation for your data. So um, in many cases, uh, when you work for a consultancy or when you do a project at university, you collect the data, uh, you know what is in that data, and then you forget about this data. It's very important that you, do you document well the way the survey has been conducted, the way it has been stored, what is in the data. Uh, and so on. So this is another task that especially students, they forget because they want to produce results. And nobody cares about um, uh, uh, leaving to others what uh, is in the data. Another thing is that in many cases, the data that you receive has um, have been collected by other people. And by reading the documentation, you need to understand what is in the data and how it, is, how it has been stored. So it's you want to leave the data for other people, and you want to understand what other people have done when collecting the data. And also, um, if you are able to collect the data yourself, this gives you freedom, because then you can collect whatever you want, analyze whatever problem you want, and so be able to, um, um, to, um, to um, build uh, new models, new ideas, new frontiers of knowledge. For example, I have a good example. Uh, a friend of my students who is a Chinese guy, just in his master, he has collected um, perception on a level of service uh, um, 
from pedestrian in China, so he's a Chinese guy, and just out of his master, he has been able to publish two good papers, one in transportation and one in transportation research part A. So um, just this to let you know that being able to collect data, have imagination about data, this is also a very nice area of research. So you need surveys, you need to collect data, uh, and it's not just about surveys in transportation, but it's also about survey in land use, which is now, you know, that we want to uh, have, we have not seen this that much, but um, in research now we want to, to have together transportation models and land use um, model. So you need both transportation data and land use data. Um, in fact, um, and this is important because we say that travel is uh, derived demand in the sense that we don't travel just for the sake of traveling, but we travel because uh, we want to participate into activity. So if you see uh, the transportation model this way, you can see that um, the data that you need, uh, it's, the, it's much larger in the sense that you need to know uh, where people go, details about um, the land use of this destination. For example, how much is built environment, how much is green area, how much is shopping area, and so on. This is because we do um, activities at this destination. The way I was showing you, I was constructing tours and uh, activity duration and so on. So this is uh, why we need land use surveys on the top of transportation surveys. And also you know that the amount of travel which takes place between uh, land uses will depend on the quality and quantity of the transportation systems. Um, and so the surveys of the transportation system inventory is uh, um, playing a major role in specifying the location and characteristic of the available transportation systems. If you see transportation and land use together, you want to, um, to collect data about travel pattern uh, by any means or another. So it means that you don't need just to know origin and destination and mode, but you need to know many more information uh, if you want to do this kind of modeling. For example, uh, you need to know who is going where, so this is origin destination, with whom, if he is going alone, if he's going with friends or member of the family, at what time. Now departure time is becoming very, very important. Uh, there are people just developing model of departure time, and myself have been asked to do something for Maryland. So you want more than route and for which purpose. So you see all these are models, right? So the first model, who is going where, is a destination choice model. Uh, with whom is allocation of the activities to the family members. At what time is departure time choice model? By which mode is choice model? And route is route choice model for assignment. Uh, what purpose is um, heterogeneity in travel behavior? So is mode and route and uh, all kinds of things by purpose. So you need to know all this information at the end if you want uh, to have a good model, a good integrated transportation model. Uh, but then, in order to, um, to model these uh, decisions, you need to have uh, the characteristics for this model. So you need to know travel times and travel time variability. Uh, for example, travel time variability is very important for departure time choice model because you need to decide, you need to model how people decide about departure time. So, uh, the, the easiest way to model departure time, uh, what you can find in a good state of practice model is for example, um, um, I'm leaving at AM peak or AM out of peak or I'm leaving PM peak or PM out of peak. So it's kind of um, discretizing the, the time from zero to 24 hours and I'm saying, or I leave at night. So say uh, from seven to nine, this is AM peak. From 9 to 3, this is AM out of peak. From 3 to 6, this is PM peak. And this is um, until 10, I would say this is PM out of peak, right? And this is night. 
So this is a typical uh, discrete choice model for departure time. So you have five discrete alternatives, and you have AM and PM, and you have AM peak and um, PM, uh, AM, and you have peak and out of peak. And in order to be able to see model, a model like this, you need to know travel time variability. So you need to know how much is travel time during peak and how much is travel time uh, in out of peak. Um, then, for example, if you are uh, modeling transit, you need to know passenger waiting times. You want to know vehicle occupancy, how many people are in the car. Uh, this is, for example, very important for all kinds of HOT, HOV studies, in which you want to know if there is one passenger, two passengers, three passengers, and so on. And uh, there is a lot of data about safety. I'm not an expert on safety, uh, but many people are collecting and modeling uh, all kinds of safety problems. So this is not really my cup of tea, <laughs> safety. But anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a very um, large um, uh, part of the research going on in transportation. Um, so um, the other thing here is that um, um, so many of these surveys, they try to measure the system characteristics as they are now. So they reflect um, the real behavior of the system and the real behavior of the user of this system. And this is different from what we will see tomorrow, which, is, um, which are surveys that attempt to measure a system that they not exist yet. So they want to study something that do not exist yet, which is called stated preference data. So now here I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about revealed preference data. Uh, so we use this data, so data about the system characteristic now, in order to predict changes that will occur in the system. Uh, for example, we use that data and that model to predict the changes in travel demand as a result of changes in the physical system uh, or changes in the operating characteristic of that system. So we measure the system, we have the model, and we predict the changes of that system in time. Another important thing is that you need not only to know the characteristic of the transportation system, but you also need to have good um, idea about uh, different groups in the population and how they will react to changes in the transportation system. Right? So this is about what we have seen in modeling. Try to make the connection between what we have seen in modeling and what we are, we are do, uh, seeing now in data collection. So we need to have representative groups of the population because we know that behavior is different across different groups of the population. So you want to have enough information in order to be able, for example, to understand that low income is behaving very differently from high income, that the young generation is, becoming, is very different from the elderly generation. For example, in the US and in Europe now, we have a problem of um, aging population. So this population is living long. Uh, they are active until they are very old. And so they have, but they have different um, needs. So there are people just working on, el on elderly. Or, or for example, there are people just working on kids. They want to educate kids to walk to school and not to use the car, to use the bus, and so on. And in this country, I'm, I, I also think that the young generation is behaving very differently from the old generation. So this is why you want to, have, um, to study heterogeneity. So this means that you need to identify demographic and socioeconomic groups um, and then have different models for each of these uh, demographic and socioeconomic groups. Um, and this is because we know that individuals react to changes in the transportation system in different ways. Um, so on the top of um, collecting data about what people do, uh, many people are also interested in perception and attitude surveys. Uh, this is different. This is different from asking people what you do or what you have done. This is about what do you think about this. How do, uh, what is your attitude with respect to that? And this is many people are working on this because, for example, suppose the um, electric cars. 
So people have a different attitude now with respect to the environment. So they are more concerned, they, um, they feel greener, and so their perception about pollution or their attitude with respect to new policies uh, can be also part of the model. And uh, remember that I said now latent variables um, are very popular in transportation, and they need this kind of survey. They, you need additional information. You, you need to know which are their perception and attitude with respect to surveys. So in this page, that is very old page uh, from, my, uh, from a very old book, but this is kind of what is popular now in transportation. So this can be latent classes or mixed logic because it's heterogeneity. And this can be latent variables because it's uh, everything it's what you cannot observe directly, but you can model with perception and attitude surveys. So see, this is also popular in the um, uh, literature of sociology or uh, influence uh, on travel behavior and so on. Um, so uh, another thing is that when you collect data, in many cases, you collect data because you want to fulfill one or more of this uh, problem above here. So you try to, um, to have a comprehensive view of, of the problem that you are analyzing. So you, you do not construct the survey just for one purpose, but you try to have different things in your survey. So this, this is what we want to do when we collect the data. So we describe, we want to be able mainly to describe existing condition at a given time uh, in order to describe um, the transportation phenomena. So this is revealed preference, right? This is describe existing condition at a given time. This is what I call revealed preference data. Uh, then you want to establish causal explanation of condition at a given time so you, ca you can have a greater understanding of the transportation system behavior. Uh, then you want to uh, have kind of descriptive analysis of the survey results, making predictive models, uh, and predict uh, the effect of system changes. So when you collect the data, you need to have clear in your mind what is the objective. So you want to know uh, what are you going to do with this survey. So you, w you need to uh, collect all the data that are necessary to calibrate the model and to predict the changes uh, in your system. So that's why I think in transportation it's very good to, uh, to know to, uh, how to collect data and, and how to model because in, you have a clear, in your, when you are a modeler, you have a clear in your mind which kind of data you want and then if you are able to collect the data, then you can collect exactly the information you want. Uh, sometimes you are also interested in uh, measuring the effect of system changes and in this case, for example, you want to collect before and after surveys. Um, uh, we should do more of this. Uh, you don't see many studies in transportation about before and after um, surveys. So uh, sometimes we implement a number of uh, important changes in our transportation systems and nobody's checking what's going on there. For example, I don't know if something happened here when they introduced the MRT. If I understand well, MRT here was a very important change in the transportation system. It kind of changed the life of the people in Taipei. Uh, I don't know if anybody collected data before and after. And uh, in order, for example, also to be able to ask more money for the construction of more MRT. Um, actually, um, in the ninth, in the, at the end of the 90s, when I was doing my PhD dissertation, I was lucky enough to work on, the, on a project similar to MRT. In Denmark, in Copenhagen, they decided to uh, extend their um, uh, metro system and so they built a new metro line and this is a good example of a country that decided to do before and after survey so they monitored constantly the changes in travel behavior to the introduction of uh, a metro system so if you work for the government I think that um, it's important to push for this kind of studies uh, or um, even better um, you can establish a regular series of monitoring surveys uh, that uh, monitors the changes in the transportation system characteristic or behavior. So I will say that the National Household Travel Survey, which is um, the topic of the day, is kind of um, a regular series of monitoring um, travel behavior. 
So it's really try to monitor um, on a regular basis, like every five, seven, eight years, sometimes 10 years, uh, what's happening in travel behavior. Okay, so doing um, a uh, transport survey is all this. So you have the preliminary planning, which is kind of determining your objective, um, determine the resources that you have, and specify the content of the survey. Then uh, you need to select the survey method. So uh, you need to select the survey time frame, uh, the survey technique, uh, and take into account possible errors uh, that are associated with the type of service that you have chosen. Then you design, um, um, you design the sample, so you define the target population, the units of the sample, the frame, the method, and again, error and bias associated with this sample design, um, estimation of the parameter variances, and then you construct the sampling. Uh, then you proceed with the um, survey instrument design, so you design the content of the question, the trip recording techniques, the question type, format, working, ordering, and instruction. And then you execute as a pilot. This is very important. There is any serious surveys um, as a pilot because you want to know um, how good uh, is your uh, design and your implementation. So you kind of have um, a five, between five and 10% of the data collected with the pilot. Then you check if the results are good or not, and then you proceed um, with the real survey. Then uh, you have the administration of the survey, so you need to, uh, to, uh, to decide about who is going to do physically the survey. So if it is a self-completion survey, uh, if it is a personal interview, if it is a telephone interview, if it is an interceptor in-depth interview survey, how you are monitoring um, the administration of the survey, you need to have quality control and decide, well, uh, if computer will be part of your survey. Then once you have the data on your desk, then you need to go to the data, uh, the data entry programs, um, and all the coding administration. So for example, um, as I said, I've been part of um, the first national household travel survey in Belgium, so 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were able to uh, get uh, money from the um, uh, government in Belgium, and we convinced them that it was time for Belgium to have a national household travel service. So they didn't, they didn't have anything. So we did the, the, um, the survey, it went very well, and then we, um, we had also a regional data collection, and we had a big fight with the region about the data entry. So um, we we did, we did a one-time data entry, and um, at the end they were not willing to accept the data because they wanted a two times data entry. So they wanted the data entered two times because they said that this will reduce the error. So there was a huge uh, debate about um, the validity of our data, and anyway, so this is just to tell you that each step of this is a big issue. So it's, it's uh, the way you decide about this, uh, it's, uh, it's going to affect the quality of the data, the way you present the data, and so on. So it's, it's uh, and also I, s I always say to my client when they want me to collect the data that I need the time and I need to think about how I collect the data because there is not a second chance in the sense that if you, co if you run the survey and the data is not good, uh, so there won't be money again to collect uh, data again. So it's just a waste of money. So this is also, um, I was responsible in Belgium for the data collection for the entire city of Brussels. So millions of euros were involved in that project and they were pushing me to deliver the results. And I said, look, um, I need to think about this because we, if we are going to spend the money, then there is no second chance. So if I collect bad data, that will, that is, that's it. So after you have processed the data, then you edit the data. Uh, you check for correction, secondary data comparison, correction of internal biases. Uh, and just here, you start to explore the data, make descriptive statistics, uh, build the model, uh, check the results. And very important, you manage your database, and you leave to the people who are going to use the database enough um, data support 
uh, and you want them to understand what is in that data, right? And this, this is a lot of work. Then you present the results, uh, and then uh, you uh, store uh, and archive the data. So as you see, this is um, a lot of work. Um, so you need a lot of people doing that, and uh, so you need and also for that, you need a multidisciplinary um, uh, knowledge, right? You need the people who are in, uh, specialized in survey. Actually, in Maryland, we have a program about uh, survey, um, which is called survey method. And they are mainly statisticians. So they work about um, this, mainly, uh, sampling error, sampling bias. Uh, definition of target population. So they mainly consult uh, for the um, uh, census data. And um, then you, if you are doing transport survey, you, know, you need people that know about um, transportation. And then you need people that know about um, data archive and uh, manipulation of big data set and uh, modelers. So again, there are many people working at the same time on one uh, data collection. Uh, the other problem, as I said, budget is very important because you have a fixed budget. So based on that budget, you need to determine which is the, um, the survey method that is the more adapted to fulfill your objective and, that will, uh, and uh, for which you stay under budget. Uh, so the budget will also de determine the quantity of the data that you can collect, so their quality uh, and the, the possible error associated with that. Um, so there is always a kind of uh, quantity versus quality. So if you are working under a fixed budget, you also uh, need to specify how much data you can collect. And is this data enough for the analysis that you want to uh, conduct later on? Um, so there is always this trade-off between the sample size and the amount of data collected. So the, the choice is I want a long survey or I want a shorter survey um, that is um, g given to more people. Um, the other problem is that as the length of the survey increases, the response rate will generally decrease. And so you need also to take into account this. Uh, when you uh, are designing your survey. This is another important issue in transformation, in uh, transportation, the time frame for survey. So I will show you two ways of collecting data in transportation. So in, um, it is possible to collect data from a cross-sectional or time series. So many of the data that we collect are uh, cross-sectional. But um, there are some examples of time series data in transportation. Um, so you also see that this is kind of, if you collect time series data, then you have all this kind of problem of panel data, right? Because you have the same observation collected uh, across different time frames. So um, you can see the relation between what we model and with the data that we collect. So cross-sectional means that you collect data at one point in time over a large number of uh, groups uh, that are fraction of the, po the total population. So National Household Travel Survey is a typical um, cross-sectional uh, survey. So it means, so what happens in the National Household Travel Survey is that you collect data, one day travel survey, so one day travel survey, just one day, uh, from a large um, um, from a large uh, sample of the population. And uh, you do this on, at one point in time. Actually, uh, you do this over a year. So for example, usually we start in spring, we start in March, and we finish in February the, year, the, the following year. And each household is asked to describe the, um, the, the, um, all the travels and all their characteristics for just one day. Uh, so this is how it is collected in many countries. Um, U.S. is like this. Uh, Belgium was like this. Um, U.K. was like this. There are some examples in which two days are collected. Uh, sometimes it's one weekday, and, one, uh, and the other one is a weekend day. Uh, for example, in Belgium, uh, the Flanders, which uh, is um, a region, they had a lot of money, and they decided to collect two days. 
But at the end of the day, they just used the first day because using the two days was very complicated and the second day didn't work very well. So, well, they could afford it, they had plenty of money, but at the end, they could make the same analysis that we were making at the national level by using just one day. So it depends. Uh, the problem is in transportation is how many days we need in order to define variability in travel behavior. That's why you want to uh, have time series survey conducted, right? So usually what you do, you have a small number of groups in the population because you cannot afford to have a very large sample, but you observe them at successive points in time. For example, that can be in before and after studies or can be a time series survey. This can be a long-term time series or a short-term time series. A long-term time series can be, is, for example, the Dutch National Mobility Panel that took place, um, that has been running every five years, I think four or five times. They have stopped at one point uh, because they thought it's too expensive. Maybe they are starting again uh, to collect um, a, um, so these were, um, um, so these were interviewing uh, people every five years, and I think they did, it, did, they did it for five or six times. And also um, in, in the U.S. there is this Paget Sound region in the, which started in 89, and they were following the same kind of people. These are called baby boomers, uh, people who were born in the 60s, and so they followed them um, for um, 20, 25 years. So they were kind of young when they um, started to collect the data. They were kind of in the late 20s and they followed them until they were 50. So they had babies, they raised family, uh, they moved and uh, they changed the job and um, so they followed these people. So you can see how difficult it is to keep track of these people because, you know, people change address, they change, uh, they move around, and so it's very difficult to have this kind of um, panel survey. But people claim that just by doing this, you can really analyze changing it, changes in travel behavior. Another time series, uh, and I will show you uh, the example, a short time series survey is, for example, MobiDrive, right? The, the survey that I was um, using for my mixed logic model. And there, um, Kayak Southern have, have, have observed people over six weeks. So he had um, 160 households, 360 uh, individuals um, that were um, uh, completing a travel diary over six weeks. So 42 days just 42 days. Well, um, it is also possible to do this retrospective um, service, although um, in transportation you don't see this much because uh, usually we say that remembering about uh, trips uh, and um, uh, or all the origin destination uh, mode and purposes, it's very difficult to do in a retrospective way. So it's very difficult to recall what you have done last year uh, on uh, July 22nd. Um, it's impossible. Um, so we don't do that much, um, but what we do is uh, we ask people do what they will do in the future, and this is called stated preference survey. So um, I do a lot of these stated preference surveys. As I said, they are quite popular in Europe. Um, I would say that these are applied in real projects, while in the United States they are um, a bit skeptic about that, so they are not very used in the United States. However, I think it's the only uh, way we can kind of make projection, uh, especially when um, a new transportation system in the, is introduced. For example, uh, if you want to build a new metro line for uh, MRT, and if you want to see how many people are going to use that uh, MRT, this is uh, the kind of survey you need. Um, but also what is very important is that uh, we are learning now in transportation to join together these different data sources. So you need to be more and more uh, good in joining huge databases. So for example, I work with uh, joint revealed and stated preference surveys. So I've done a lot of this modeling because you can strength uh, the, um, your model by having different data sources. Or for example, you can combine the way I was, we were discussing with the professor who used 
uh, you usually sit there, um, about joining transportation data survey and land use data. Um, now you have GIS, you can, uh, you have uh, all kinds of information. So um, especially for the students who have time to work on, on, uh, on data, so I suggest uh, that you try to combine the different sources of data. So um, when you collect longitudinal surveys, there are two distinct uh, variations. You can do successive sample or panel studies. So successive survey, it means that you have different sample of the same population at each stage in time series. So it means that um, it means that every so the survey is the same, right? So it, it's the, the, the kind of question you are asking are the same, but you ask this question to different um, sample. So for example, you decide to have a travel survey in 85, then in the 90s, in 95, and you ask the same question to different people. You have a kind of uh, variability in travel behavior, but it's not the interpersonal, intrapersonal variability. It's kind of more of a variability over time. Or you can have a panel study, and I think this, this is uh, the way the Dutch people were doing. So they were, they were not the same people. They were different people ask, uh, responding to the same question over time. While a real panel study is a, is a study in which, uh, starting from time zero, you always retain the same individuals, right? So this is the difference. So both follow people over time. But the first one, the success is sample. Uh, they ask the same question to different people, and the, the panel study, they ask the same question to the same people. And this is uh, what they were doing in, um, um, in, the, in the Paget Sound um, uh, data, in this. So I, if I remember well, the Dutch National Mobility Panel is of the first type, this. And the budget sound is of the second time. Of this, I'm sure, because I remember that these are the baby boomers. So they are always the same people. Um, and uh, in transportation, these surveys have been used a lot. Um, there, um, many of the papers from Kitamura, Professor, I'm citing Kitamura, uh, are using this. So Kitamura worked in the United States, but Many of his papers are based on this, on the Dutch uh, uh, national uh, panel data, uh, because he was interested on uh, car ownership over time. He was interested in activity participation over time. So he had no data in, uh, in the US, and he was using this. And then uh, many of the study from, for example, Costas Gullias is using this a lot because he's interesting now, for example, in aging population. So it's interesting to know how these people who are now 60s, uh, are in their 60s, what they are doing. Are they still active? Are they still using their car? Uh, where do they live in suburban and urban areas? So all kinds of um, analysis he can do. This is advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so advantages, what you can do with panel data um, so you can uh, work about changes, right? If you, if you have a, a panel data, you can analyze, analyze changes in travel behavior over time. Um, so and you, can I, you can have an idea about dynamics of changes. Uh, you, can ask, you can ask new questions, and so you can accumulate more information. For example, you can add more attitude or perception um, uh, question like, you know, now we are concerned about the environment. What do you think about the environment? Is pollution a concern? What do you think about an electric car? And so on. Um, so if you interview the same people over time, the people, they know you, and they are committed. So it's very likely that they will stay in the, um, um, in the, um, in, in the, in the study. And then, um, so between sample variance is eliminated because this is always the same person. So you, you don't have this, you don't need to uh, model between uh, sample variance because this is always the same um, a sample. Disadvantages, um, it is very difficult to find the respondents who are willing and able to be interviewed on repeated occasion. Uh, and for example, uh, Kayak Sausen was kind of paying his people 
uh, but just uh, not much. He, I think he gave something like uh, 200 uh, Swiss franc, which is uh, in Switzerland just enough for a good dinner at the restaurant. Uh, so, uh, you know, for participating for 42 days, it's a, it's a lot of your time. But he was kind of giving an incentive to these people. Uh, people uh, change places where they live, uh, but, um, well, you can expect um, greater involvement of the structure in the survey because they commit themselves. Um, questions should remain stable over time. Uh, uh, difficult to ensure that no other changes occur. So you need to be sure that this is representative of the population and this is difficult because you have very small sample, um, usually in this uh, longitudinal panel. So where, um, um, so which, where do we get our data from? So when we start a model, where do we, we need to decide where we get the data from? So sometimes data exists. Uh, so for example, I asked Kaya Xausen, I you have this data, can you please share the data with me? And he said, yes. Then you have household self-completion service. It means that these are data, so these are different ways to collect the data. Um, household self-completion survey is when uh, you give um, a piece of paper to the households with a number of questions and they will complete the survey by themselves. So um, it, you suppose that they are good enough, they understand the survey and so they will uh, complete the survey themselves. Then you have telephone surveys, this is the way um, uh, uh, national household travel survey um, are uh, collected. So. Um, they send out uh, the, the question, uh, so the people, they can read the question and they give the answer on the telephone. Intercept survey is when uh, you stop people at certain uh, point. Uh, for example, uh, remember the data, the Brussels data? We stopped the people on the highway with the police, so we drove them to uh, a rest area. They were scared, uh, and at the end they said, well, complete the survey. Um, and, um, but we had a very good response rate with the police. <laughs> um, household personal interview survey, so you, you send interviewers to the household and they complete uh, with the respondents um, the, the interview. Then you have group survey and in-depth survey. So group survey is when you sit on a table with a limited number of person, for example, eight, 10 person, and then you do the interview, and um, in many cases you record, you t videotape the interviews in order to see how these people react to different questions. And in that survey is really face-to-face -face interview with one person uh, in order to know everything about his behavior or her behavior. So direct observational surveys, this is kind, and these are becoming more and more popular because we have more and more video recording, digital imaging, and instrumented vehicles. Um, so I don't work a lot with that, but all the people who are working in route choice model, for example, or assignment, uh, they use a lot all this, uh, or safety, I believe. Um, they use a lot of this uh, video recording, digital imaging, and the instrumented vehicles. Now, um, a colleague of mine is doing a lot with um, the uh, instrumented vehicles. He's using Bluetooth data in order to study travel time, variability in travel time, and uh, question related to security and safety. Then you have traffic counts. Uh, traffic counts have been very important for the adjustment of the OD matrices, you know, with traffic counts. So traffic counts are regularly collected. For example, Maryland State Highway Administration, they spend an unbelievable amount of money in order to collect traffic counts because they need to fill origin destination matrices. Um, another thing that you need to know is uh, system performance surveys such as travel time, intersection delay, uh, public transport performance surveys. Uh, I have a friend of mine who are just working on uh, public transport performance surveys. In places where public transportation is very important, like here, you want to check um, how they are doing with respect to travel time, late arrival, late departure, and so on. Um, route characteristics and um, uh, so this is more about the transportation system, right? This is not telling us much about behavior. This is more about um, um, 
having the system under control, there is not telling us much about behavior. That's why maybe I don't use much this kind of data. So then you have this household self-completion surveys, and uh, so you decide to go for this when you have a kind of survey that is kind of easy to understand uh, because you need, you don't, um, it's the household that needs to understand, to fully understand the question, uh, to formulate the answer and to transcribe the answer into the questionnaire. Um, so um, um, possible method for collection and distribution, so you mail out the questionnaire and you ask them to mail back the questionnaire or you can deliver uh, the, the respondents to the questionnaire and ask them to mail the questionnaire back or uh, deliver to the respondent and collect it from the respondent. So going this way, you increment the response rate, but it's more expensive. So there is always this trade-off between response rate and, um, um, and cost. So the more contact you have with the household, the more likely they are that uh, respond to your survey, because they think that this is a serious effort, they understand well why this, and so on. Advantages versus disadvantages of self-completion survey is that um, uh, self-completion are less expensive. It's the least expensive way to collect data. You can cover a, a wide geographical area. Um, interviewer effects are eliminated because sometimes having interviewer is not a good idea in the sense that you can influence the respondents, right? Because the respondents understand the game. So for example, if you are collecting attitude versus electric car, um, what happens is that the respondent understands that you are kind of promoting electric car. So in order to please you, he will say, oh yes, I'm very positive. I'm going to buy this and so on. For example, I've seen, um, I have seen uh, results from uh, John Walker, who, is, who was running an interview um, at Berkeley. And the attitude versus electric car were amazing. I think this was a clear example in which people understood the game and they were just pleasing uh, the, the interviewer. Um, so the respondent is also sitting quietly at home, so he has time to respond, so he can select the time where he has time uh, to respond. Disadvantages is that um, you have a high level of non-response. So the response rate for uh, um, self-completion survey is very low. Um, and you need to be care very careful about layout and wording because um, the, the, the household need to understand. I remember that um, in order to describe the, what was an activity and what was a trip and what was the purpose, in, uh, for, the, for the Belgian National Household Travel Survey, we had one page of description with you know, nice uh, little houses, nice shops, and uh, we wanted to understand the people how to respond. It is difficult to ensure that uh, the correct person fills out the questionnaire. For example, if you want to interview the household, you want uh, the, uh, the head filling the questionnaire for himself, and you don't want him to fill, for example, for his wife or for his children. Everybody needs to uh, fill the questionnaire by themselves. Um, so, and uh, this is also what we have got very often. Um, you get responses from uh, the most, uh, the more educated people, right? Because um, they understand the problems and they are willing to, to respond. Uh, one stage question can be asked, so you, you don't have a chance to um, ask a second question. Um, um, you cannot um, collect supplementary information, for example, residential environment or attitude towards the survey. Telephone survey, these are very popular uh, because they have been used in market research uh, outside the area of transportation. And in the United States, this is the way surveys are conducted. If you live in the United States, you always get telephone call still now um, about uh, all kinds of questions, you know, um, electoral vote and uh, marketing stuff and so on. But now um, there is a problem because, you know, many people are um, giving up the fixed line and uh, there, are no, there is no um, list of cell telephone number. So NHTS, people at NHTS are really worried about this. Um, and they think that this might bias their results. So they are working and they want suggestions from us 
uh, they want to know uh, how they can overcome this problem. So given that NHTS is a telephone survey interview, that is the main challenge that they are facing now. They want to understand the fact that many families are switching to um, cell phones, how this is going to affect uh, their results. So telephone can reach any kinds of people in any place, urban area or rural area, for example, right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to have um, a personal assisted survey and you need to send people in the middle of nowhere, this is very expensive, while with the telephone uh, you can easily reach them. You, can, you have a better supervision of the interviewers, uh, then uh, this was also very important, computer assisted telephone interviews, because while you are on the phone you are uh, inputting the data on this system and this is um, the way uh, people are doing in the United States. So you have a check of the responses. You can check if there is inconsistency. You can ask um, again uh, for the right answer. These are cheaper than personal interview uh, because you don't need to send the people in the field. Uh, you can use um, the telephone to validate and clarifying a number of questions that m I, sometimes they are not very clear. Um, you can do this in, multiple, in multi multilingual societies, uh, dealing with people who do not speak the language of the interviewers. Um, and this is important in the United States. There are many people who they don't speak English. They just speak Spanish, for example. And so you can deal with that. For example, when I did the survey in Belgium, you know, Belgium is a very small country, very small country, and they have two languages, two official languages. So everything we did um, was translated in two languages. I had no idea about Dutch. I had to train interviewers in French, in Dutch, in German. So um, it's, it's complicated. Um, and also these are kind of fast um, and low cost um, survey and you can also identify rare population so you can expand your survey to rare population. Disadvantages, there is a limit on the length of the survey. Usually we say that no more than 20 minutes. After 20 minutes people they will just give up. They will say no, this is too much. Usually we start to we uh, uh, tends to stay on the telephone in 10, uh, between 10 uh, to spend 10 or 15 minutes. Although National Household Travel Survey is very complicated, so I think it takes much longer than 20 minutes. I don't know, but um, um, so well, the number of people in the household um, is limited. So you can talk to one people. Uh, you need to uh, establish a contact in the beginning because you want to uh, have the respondents to stay on the telephone and talk to you. Um, well, this is old book, but you know, you have a sample bias because there are people without phones. Now it's not true anymore because there are people without fixed phone and they have cell phone and you have no access to that. Um, um, no visual aid, so the, the people is just responding in the dark. You cannot give him, unless you did not uh, send him uh, a complete package. Uh, with, this is what happens in the, for the National Household Travel Survey. They receive documents before, so they have kind of uh, visual aid um, with, um, with, with material. Intercept survey, this is when you intercept people. Um, and uh, what you can do, for example, uh, you can intercept them on public transport vehicles. These, these are very um, popular for public transportation because you can send students into buses, into trains, uh, in the waiting area of the airport. And this is a good time to get to do a survey because people are just sitting there. Uh, they have nothing else to do and you can have a very good response rate. Uh, or you can have at the cordon points or roads people, so for example, waiting at the traffic light, you can give them a questionnaire and ask them to send it back and so on. So these are onboard vehicle distribution and then you tell them to mail back or everything happens on board. Uh, or you collect some information on board and then you mail uh, other information. Uh, you can have roadside distribution, intercept inter interviews and activity centers, for example, at the shopping mall. We have tried this, but in the US it didn't work. So people at the shopping mall, they were too busy shopping. So nobody stopped. Um, to answer um, our question. So we had to change um, approach. Personal interview is when uh, you send an interviewer uh, to record the responses. Uh, and um, usually this takes place 
at home. Advantages, well, you have higher response rate. You can have, uh, this is, I think, very optimistic, between 75 and 85 um, response rate. Um, and uh, you can ask all kinds of questions. It's a very flexible way to collect uh, data. You can also kind of collect attitude, opinions, open-ended verbal answer, or all kinds of non-quantitative information that, are, uh, that you want to collect. Um, I would say that many of my stated preference data collection are of this type, with a personal interview, uh, when I can afford it. So it means when I have budget to do it. Um, so, um, or for example, the, um, you haven't seen that, but we have results from a car um, ownership, a stated preference on car ownership. What we did is that we distributed the flyer and we tried to have uh, a kind of interaction with um, the, um, the, the household. So we, we, we knocked at their door and we said, you know, we are conducting a survey. This is the, um, the email, at, uh, the, um, the website where uh, our survey is, but please complete it. We are a no-profit organization. We are the university, so we tried to convince them. So when you have an interviewer, you can give all kinds of explanation. Um, you can uh, um, uh, carry out the interview in a very short period of time, uh, for example, just uh, six weeks. Um, you can also uh, run a very long interview because once you are there, um, you can complete a longer interview, up to half an hour, I would say. Uh, the interviewer can give um, um, help to the respondents and he can assess also the validity of the answers and he can collect all kinds of spontaneous answers uh, from any particular individual. Disadvantages, well, this is nice to do, but this is really expensive. Um, I would say that in Europe, each of the stated preference uh, with personal interview costs 100 euro, so 100 euro each. Uh, maybe in the States it's a little bit less expensive, but um, it's, it's very expensive. Um, they are three or ten times more expensive than returned questionnaire and uh, because you, you, have, you have to pay people and they need to travel to the place where you want to collect the data. You have, um, um, oh, another thing that happens uh, that in order to reduce travel expensive, uh, what you can do is you kind of create clusters because you send the, the interviewers into a neighborhood and then you will interview many households in this neighborhood. However, this introduces bias. We have done a, a very nice study about this um, with uh, this student of mine. We have very nice results. So what, uh, this was not a transportation survey. This was NIH. NIH is um, uh, data from health, right? So it's kind of a travel survey, but just for health. So they ask people all kind of questions about their health. Um, I don't know, uh, weight, uh, uh, medical problem, medicaments that they take, so all kinds of questions. Because in the United States, well, in every country, I, uh, the, the expenses for health are very important. So they want to know how they are doing. But what happens is that these are personal uh, interviews. So res uh, interviewers are sent to the neighborhood. And so they try to interview all the people in this neighborhood. And in the United States, um, the cluster effect is very important because suppose where I live in the United States, all people have about the same income that we have. The same number of cars, the same number of kids, the same insurance, they work at the same place. So we showed that, the, um, um, that you need to account for this cluster effect because otherwise you have very biased um, coefficient. So it's good, but at the same time, it's not very good. So I think this was very important. And we were doing this with this survey method um, um, uh, program in, um, at Maryland. So they were very pleased to see that what they were guessing was true by modeling. So we clearly showed that there was a bias. Uh, and the other thing is what I said. Um, the, the interaction is never neutral in the sense that uh, households are not stupid. They understand the meaning of the game, the goal, the objective, and they start to please you. They start to say, oh, yes, I'll do this, I'll do this, and, uh, in, and in reality, they will never do this in reality. So they understand the, the rules of the game. Group survey, um, 
So these are kind of um, focus group. Uh, have you heard about focus group? These are not very popular in transportation, but these are used a lot in a kind of social study, uh, economic study. Uh, and um, usually, as I said, these are small group of people, usually between seven and nine, and they are predator they are selecting according to a criteria. For example, one of these that we wanted to do but we have never done at the end is that, um, um, for example, we, we were working, I mentioned very often this project, we were um, uh, studying transportation needs of low income population. So the client, they want us to select um, about 10 um, low income households and discuss with them about their needs. But at the end, the project didn't really work because uh, we said, you know, before doing that, you needed to analyze a larger sample of the population. Otherwise, your results will be not representative of the population. So, we, so at the end, uh, there, was, there was not a good communication with the client. So we delivered some results. But at the end, we never did that, which I think it was interesting. I was in a student from Berkeley interviewing low income population this way, and she got very nice results. Um, so uh, what is important in this kind of um, uh, survey is that um, you have the group together. So there are dynamics of group. You can see how people interact and how people have different opinion regarding the same subject. Um, so um, it's the, the, this data is particularly rich, although it comes from a very small group of the population. And um, you know you you can also make hypotheses and uh, get information. For example, for the low-income population, we were interested in knowing, for example, if transportation was really an issue in getting a job. For example, you are a low-income population, you have limited mobility. So if the job is very far away, the fact that there is no connection was limiting the accessibility to that job. Or for example, was more a family issue. Many of these low-income people, they are single mothers with kids. So the fact that they don't have access to a daycare close to where they live, is this affecting more than the transportation? So we want to analyze this kind of dynamics. And you cannot capture this in a normal national household travel survey. You need this kind of group survey or more focused um, data collection. Advantages, uh, everyone is in the same boat all around the table. So they are not intimidated like in a one-on-one -on -one in-depth interview. Um, you can get react, um, information about reaction of the respondents to certain question. Um, and um, you can engage people in um, interaction and in creative conversation. Uh, you can observe different ranges of attitude and behavior. Um, um, yeah, um, maybe it's, it could be useful also to have um, uh, the people who are making the policy. For example, people from agency participating to this kind of uh, data collection effort, because they can understand more the motivation of the people. And sometimes when you are in a group, you will say things that in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, face-to-face interview, we will never say, right? Because we are all in the same boat. We share the same problem. You realize that there are other people, for example, that have the same difficulties as you have, uh, for example, if you belong to the low-income population. Sometimes it's difficult to get this attitude and belief, especially from um, special part of the population, for example, the low income of handicapped and so on. Uh, the group may react negatively to the facilitator. Perhaps they don't like him or her. Um, and uh, one of the respondents can have a stronger personality and then answer to all the questions, leaving in the dark the others. Um, and uh, you can lose the focus. Sometimes the conversation goes in a totally different direction than the one you expected. In that interview, is similar to the focus group. Um, and um, this is more for question regarding derived demand. Um, 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 
So for example, you can have more information about um, travel patterns and expenditure information. So remember that um, ex we never have uh, in transportation uh, survey um, information about uh, expenditure. So how you expand your income, which is very important. In all the problem like car ownership, right? So if you decide to buy a car, uh, this is a very important decision because this will take a lot of your income. So you don't know how the income is allocated. So in this depth interview, uh, this is what you can do. For example, uh, collect information about expenditure. Um, you, perhaps you want to know who is deciding. For example, in the household, who is deciding about uh, a certain travel pattern? Who is deciding about buying a new car? Uh, who is deciding about relocating. So all these dynamics, um, you need an in-depth interview in order to understand. Um, and so these are the kind of peculiar questions that you can get with in-depth interviews. Another important, um, oh, this is also kind of um, not well done in transportation in the sense that um, and also in modeling. It's quite new to model group uh, behavior. Uh, usually we always say that one person decides. This can be an individual and a household, and we don't know the dynamics uh, in groups. So you want, if you have groups interview, you can um, have information about interaction within, uh, between participants. And uh, you can develop a gaming simulation techniques. This is also, for example, important now in all this kind of game modeling or auction uh, in freight, for example. Uh, you know, uh, now it's very popular in freight. You have a package. You want to sell this package. And you, um, you want to co uh, you collect a bid right from all the people who are interested in sending freight from point A to point B. These are kind of the data for modeling an auction. And we don't know how to do this. Uh, so I've, been, uh, I've seen attempt, for example, by Dr. Anima Massani. But at the end, he just said simulated data. It was very difficult for him to collect this kind of behavior. So I think this is open for new research, group interviews, and especially group interviews for uh, freight data. In fact, in freight, we are still debating about who is taking the decision in freight. So is the, uh, the, uh, the one who wants to send the freight, or is the one who is handling the freight? So the, all these kind of questions are still uh, not answered. And uh, I think we could get a better um, idea about how to model freight if we know this mechanism. And you know this mechanism with data and survey. Concerning um, data for um, activity-based model, uh, so you know what is activity-based model, right? So uh, in, uh, in the early 90s, people started to collect data with the Household Activity Travel Simulator, or HATS. And um, because they, people thought that collecting data for activity-based model is very difficult because you need to collect a lot of information. And people don't really understand what a travel pattern is, right? It's kind of a concept that we have in transportation. But normal people, they do not understand what a travel pattern is. So um, this was kind of uh, a visualization technique that helped people to collect the data about travel pattern. And so, um, so diaries were kind of uh, translated into physical representation for a given day by a means of colored blocks or parallel axes indicating at home activities away from home activities and connecting travel activities. So it was like. Um, you know, you needed to collect data about travel patterns. So which is the best way to collect this kind of data? So for example, you develop block like this. And you say, from 0 to 8, uh, I was home, right? And then from 8 to 8.30, um, I was traveling. And then from 8.30 to 12.30, I was at work. Uh, then I was um, out for lunch. Uh, from 3.30 to um, 8.30, I was at work. 
and so on. So kind of how to collect this data, how to efficiently collect that data. So um, these were the simulator. There are a number of famous people who have been doing this as a PhD dissertation. Um, I think in 2000, Eric Miller with Sean Doherty, he, he, um, he made one of these household activ activity travel simulator because he was collecting travel pattern over a week. And yes, that data, a number of papers have been uh, extracted from that um, uh, simulator. Um, you can also arrange kind of um, activity boards that take into account interaction between different members of the household. And, uh, and also what you can do is kind of have an interactive survey uh, in the sense that the, the interviewers or the, this uh, simulator will tell you, for example, here, um, for example, suppose that you are with an interviewer. It will say, well, it is 6 o'clock. Now it, it's very congested. What are you going to do? Would you stay more at work and leave later? or leave work and do another activity and then go home. So you can have all this kind of interactive situation uh, that, um, that are this what if. And you cannot have this if you don't have a, an activity simulator like this one. I think uh, Sean Doherty he had this kind of what if. What if uh, there is congestion? What if uh, you do another activity? What if this activity get canceled? What would you do? So this was the idea. Well. This is that these are very expensive. Uh, I've seen very few applications in reality. Um, these are three or four times more expensive than the personal interview survey. So national household travel survey is not this. So this is nice for research, but in real life, I've never seen something like that applied in reality. Uh, you need experienced interviewers. That's why I've seen many of this done by PhD students. Students who are just working on data collection. Um, and um, and uh, so uh, you can have a small number of this uh, survey completed in just one study. I think Sean Doherty collected 200 um, households with that. Um, so. Um, but these are very important if you, have, if you want to have advanced models estimated. So uh, that's why I've seen many papers extracted from this data, um, data. OK, so this is especially uh, summarizing all we have seen. Household personal interview is the one with the most yes. right? You can collect information about travel, demographics, and attitude and opinions. Um, and so I would say that we work mainly with this household, the personal interview, and household self-completion, right? So this is National Household Travel Survey. We have uh, data about travel and demographics, very detailed data, but we do not collect attitude and opinion data with um, household self-completion, which is the National Household Travel Survey. So let's uh, go over the general part until um, Noon. So amongst all the things that you need to do when you collect the data, uh, there, is a sample, there are sampling procedures. Um, so you need to decide which are the unit in your sample. And this is not a trivial task. For example, you need to decide if you want to interview individuals, households, groups, and so on. Um, so what is the population that you are going to represent? How large should be your sample? And how is the sample to be selected? OK. So you see that in transportation, uh, we can uh, collect information about people, about household, about vehicle, about geographical area, or any other discrete units. Uh, this is an example for uh, my students. So for example, in a study, you, c you say, well, I'm interested in travel patterns of children from low-income families in Prince George County. So I've delimited my population. Or in National Household Travel Survey, is the entire population of the United States. Or here can be the entire population of Taiwan, or the entire population of Taipei, or public transportation user of MIT in Taipei, right? So the, you need to define the population of interest. And the survey population is composed of individual elements, which are these uh, individual elements. This can be individuals, household, companies, geographic region, for example, cities, states, nation or you, uh, vehicles, intersection of road links, and other 
kind of transport um, features of the transport network. Now, you need to draw this uh, population from somewhere, right? So you need uh, to, um, uh, to draw this population. And depending on the sampling units, you can use different way to, um, um, to draw this population. So what you can use are, for example, um, electoral rolls. Um, we don't do that in transportation block list. This was uh, the NIH survey, right? The, the, the survey on um, health, because they were selecting uh, dwellings on residential blocks. So they were visiting a neighborhood and interviewing all the household in that neighborhood. Uh, list of the utility company, for example, electricity, telephone directory. This is um, National Household Travel Survey. Uh, we are now running another survey, and we are using mainly lists. So we are buying. There are companies who are just selling addresses. So we are buying addresses from a company, and we are going to um, send the survey to this mailing list. All uh, local area maps, for example, if I want uh, people in Taipei or in a neighborhood of Taipei, that's what I do. Census list, if it is available, society membership or motor vehicle registration. So once you decide the population, you need to draw from that population and you need to know how to reach each component of this sample. Uh, every time you draw, uh, in, for each of these sampling frames, uh, you have problems. For example, the list is not accurate. For example, as I was saying, now there is a problem of telephone directories in the sense that not all the people, they have their telephone numbers there, especially people who just have a cell phone. Uh, and they are incomplete. Um, electoral rules, they can have, for example, people who have recently moved and they are uh, in uh, two different electoral uh, lists. Uh, they can be out of date. And, um, and all these lists, they change, especially in very dynamic society like the United States. We move around many times in our life. So these lists are uh, out quickly out of date. So another thing, remember that all our models are based on the fact that we work with infinite population and uh, they are random samples. Uh, and this is true in transportation. This makes all our modeling effort uh, much easier because uh, we can assume that they um, are drawn from a very large population and they are really random. Even if the population are very large, statistics will um, teach us that very accurate estimates can be obtained also from relatively small samples. You will see that in the US, we have about 350 million people, and we uh, sample 150,000 households. So it's a relatively small number, but this is representative of the population. So um, we can obtain good results from small sample. Because the accuracy of sample parameter estimates is totally independent on the sampling being performed um, in an acceptable fashion. Um, so many of the things we do is, are based on the fact that we have random sampling. So there are many types of sampling. Uh, in many cases, we work with simple random sampling, but also we have stratified random sampling, variable fraction stratified random sampling multi-stage sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling. So this is random samples. Suppose that these are uh, uh, the member of your population. You give a number to each of these uh, member. Or this can be individuals, or this can be household. So to this star, you have one, two. You draw randomly. And suppose that out of the 16 in the population, you just draw four elements of this sample. And this is random sample, right? Uh, this is stratified random sampling is, for example, suppose that uh, you know that um, uh, these people, for example, are male and these are female. And so you want to draw from uh, strata. So you draw uh, from the male and the female randomly. So in order to have a stratified random sampling, you, have to know, you need to have prior information of the population. Um, and uh, you need to know how many uh, units are in each stratum. Um, so the question is, is still a random sample when you have strata in your, um, in your, um, random in your sampling? Uh, 
um, so it is random if each unit is sampled independently and if each unit in the population has an equal probability of being selected in the sample. So the answer is yes. So if you satisfy this two bullet point, even if you work with stratified random sampling, you are okay. So it means that you have a random sample. Sometimes when you work with stratified sampling, instead of stratifying with respect to one variable, you can stratify with respect to several variables. And so you can have an n-dimensional matrix of stratification. For example, you can uh, um, um, draw um, uh, the, the, the strata can be identified, for example, by income, gender, uh, purpose of the travel, and so on. So two drawbacks uh, with the sampling uh, fraction method is that you need to have prior information about the population. So you need to know the size of each strata, right? So if you want to sample by um, income, you need to have information about income, and you need to know how many people are in low income, how many people are in medium income, how many people are in high income, and so you need to have all this prior information, and um, given that you are sampling in each strata, um, then you have no longer the same chances of selection, then your sampling is not really random. So uh, when you estimate the model from that, uh, you need to take into account that this uh, um, uh, uh, sample is not random anymore, which, is, which makes everything a little bit more complicated. So how do you do multi-stage sampling? Um, in simple random sampling, um, you first need to enumerate the entire population. And this can become difficult if you have a large population. Uh, and sometimes um, it is useful to do this kind of a, on a uh, geographical basis. For example, in Australia, in order to sample from the entire population, they have five stages. And in particular, what they do is, uh, and I think we do the same also in the United States. So the first stage is they divide the nation into states and sample from the total population of states. Then they divide the states into local government and sample for these local governments. Then they divide the local governments into census collector districts and sample census collector districts. Then they sample the census collector districts into household and sample household. And then at the end, they select households and they divide them individual and sample individuals. And uh, I think that's the way we do the National Household Travel Survey. We, s we follow this uh, multi-stage sampling procedure. At the end, we have a random sample of individuals from the nation uh, because every individual has an equal chance of being selected. Um, but we have appropriate sampling for each uh, stage of the um, sampling procedure. This is systematic sampling. Cluster is when we divide the population into clusters, for example, geographical basis. The sampling error is, however, increased with respect to simple random sampling. Um, and the effect of cluster depends on the similarity between the units in the cluster and those in the total population. This is because, uh, so for example, the household, uh, the neighborhood and the household. Systematic sampling, this also happens, uh, for example, is when you send people uh, in the field to collect the data. And for example, you say, start to collect data from the household with number four, and then go to the 14th, and then to the 24th, and then to the 34th. This is random again, so no problem. This is a random start. Um, it's, some, it's much simpler than truly random selection. Sometimes you don't want a random sample, right? So sometimes you want um, a certain quota from a certain, so uh, for example, you say, I want 200 observation from the low income population. I want 100 observation from um, the high income population. And so uh, you want responses from a specified number of respondents. Then you can have groups and so on. Okay, so which are the errors that we encounter when um, doing survey? So the main error are called sampling error, and um, which is uh, the error in the sample data. Um, so this is sampling error is connected to the fact that instead of getting data from the entire population, we are just dealing with 
uh, a part of the population. So no matter how well designed is your sample, you always have a sampling error, right? Because you are just dealing with data from a percentage of the population. You are never collecting data from the entire population. Um, so um, the sampling error does not affect the expected value of the parameter averages, right? But it affects the variability around these averages and determine the confidence interval uh, er around these averages. So um, the, the mean value that you are estimating are, uh, are good. It's the variance around these averages that can be problematic, so the confidence interval. So it means that if you have very large confidence intervals, you have very high variability around this mean, so your results are not fully, um, you cannot fully trust your results. Um, and the other is sampling bias. So you have a sampling error due to the fact that you are not surveying the entire population, but just part of it. And the other error that you are making is the sampling bias. Um, the sampling bias is because you are making a mistake somewhere in choosing the sampling frame. For example, uh, this is not the, the right sampling frames or the sampling techniques on in many other aspects of your sample survey. So if you design well your survey, you can avoid sampling bias, right? So if your uh, survey is well designed, you can avoid sampling bias. So a good survey is a survey ca that can uh, display repeatability in the sense that if you do this survey <coughs> at different point in time, or if it is administrated to a different person, you always have the same answers. So it means a good survey is a survey in which, for example, if you have different interviewers, the results that you are getting from the different interviewers are stable. Um, so then you want a survey to be valid in the sense that you want to correct samples of the correct target population. You want a survey to be precise, so you don't want a very large um, confidence interval around the mean. Uh, so you want to be able to observe with um, um, a precision uh, the characteristic of the population. So the way you can improve accuracy is that you can um, uh, make sure that you are not eliminating systematically some member of the population and that is collected in a very random fashion. When you are deciding uh, about uh, the design of the questionnaire, you need to decide about all this, right? Suppose now that you are uh, designing yourself the questionnaire. So you need to decide what is in the questionnaire, so the content. You need to decide about the physical nature of the forms, uh, the question types, the question format, the question working, wording, the question ordering, and the question instruction. So all this is part of your questionnaire design. So in deciding about the information that you want to, want to collect, you need to uh, have three basic guidelines. So first of all, you need to determine the relevant information that you want to collect with your survey. So if you want information about travel patterns, you need to collect information about travel patterns, about departure time, about vehicle ownership. So this is really the content of the questionnaire. Uh, the data that you are collecting must be reliable in the sense that uh, it can be replicated uh, and it, the, then you need to minimize instrument uncertainty and uh, you need to have an accurate representation of the problem uh, that you are analyzing. So you also need to evaluate how much time it takes because um, you, you have a very long wish list of questions that you want to be covered. However, you have limited resources in terms of money, personnel, and so uh, you need to, uh, to understand that the um, effect of survey length on responses and validity of responses depends on the um, um, survey length. So you also need to eliminate all irrelevant questions. For example, if you are working with um, um, if you are working with um, um, travel patterns, uh, and you make a lot of question about how um, uh, spend their income. Then there is some, um, um, you know, 
people can, if, if people don't understand why you are asking certain questions, they, they can kind of mistrust you. And so the, 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 the responses that you are collecting uh, cannot be considered valid anymore. So you need to explain why you are asking this question. For example, in our vehicle ownership survey, we needed to explain, you know, we expect that in the market new car will become available. Uh, please answer your question, taking into account. So you need to create a kind of trust with the, inter with the, with the respondents. So, and also the, the way you, um, you collect the data, uh, especially in travel behavior, so this is very important. Um, so you can collect day-to-day -day travel behavior in two different contexts. The first is a travel-only context. And this is very important because this makes the difference between um, travel survey and time use survey, that both are used in transportation. So I will say that NHTS is based on it. We have debated for a long time if it was better to work under this context on this second context. So the first one is travel only context. So you explain the, the, the respondents that you are interested in travel behavior and that you want to collect data on travel behavior. So you ask them about travel, right? So, and that's the way we work with NHTS. Because we ask people to report about trips, right? We say, uh, describe all your trips. So trips number one, two, three, four, five. And so you ask about the origin, the destination, the mode, uh, the purpose, um, the departure time, um, and the arrival time. So when you ask, question like this, you are in this context, travel only context. Now, we have also, so we say, given that we are switching paradigm in the transportation from travel based context to activity based context, should we change this? We have never done this. So we, we keep, we, we are still working under a travel only context. Although you realize that if you have the list of this, you can also derive activity duration. Because if you, um, so um, for example, if you arrive at work at 8.30 and you leave work at um, 8.30, so it means that you stay at work 10 hours. So you can derive information also about activity. Although people are answering in a um, travel only context. Now the other context is a little bit like this. So they describe activity. Instead of telling you, um, um, tra in, instead of giving you detail about travel, they give detail about activities. And the same, you can have information about travel, but you have less information about travel. That's why at the end, we stayed with this framework instead of using this. This is exactly what is done in time use survey. Uh, time use surveys, they are used in economics a lot. Uh, they, they have good surveys because they have been able to unify the questionnaire. So they have one questionnaire, and this one questionnaire is the same in the United States and in all countries across Europe. I don't know if in Asia you have um, things like that, but people are um, asked to describe their time, the way they spend their, tra their, their time. So they give you activities. The problem is that you don't have a lot of information about travel. And that's why we stay with this. There are people now that are trying to combine the two. Uh, and uh, wh when I was in Belgium, um, I made, um, I tried, uh, given that we had both, we had the time use survey and we had this, I uh, calculated the activity duration from this and from this, and surprisingly, I had very close results. So it means that both, uh, they were good uh, to describe activity um, and uh, activity. Some people, they argue that this is also good to report um, travel, but um, I'm not sure. The problem with this kind of uh, travel um, only context is that uh, you don't know what they are doing at home. Uh, while this, oh, this is, reported every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes you have something like that. Um, so you have um, the 24 hours, and it's divided in 10 minutes each. 
and you have all the activity like home um, uh, sleeping, home um, uh, watching TV, and etc. A lot of detail on the activity, and then you say, well, I was doing this, I was doing this, I was doing this, I was doing this. So you have a lot of detail about uh, what you are doing at home, while in this context. You don't have this detail because you just, um, it's, there is no travel associated with that, right? So you just know that they are at home. So that's why many people are using both survey together because they want to know the detail about the activity that they are doing at home and the uh, trade-off between activity that you can do at home and activity that you can do out of home. That's why people are using both. But as I said, in transportation, we are still in this context. Um, so uh, for about the travel outside home, uh, how you record trips? You ask respondents to recall what happened at the past time, recall techniques. But usually we don't do this because, as I said, people, they do not remember what they did in the past. But we announce the respondents to, um, um, to respond in advance that they will have to report to travel about a future time. So what happens in NHTS is that we contact people and we say, uh, we want to know your travel behavior for the day, I don't know, now, suppose that I'm contacting you now, I'm saying August 1st. Right, so you prepare yourself. So um, you know in advance that you needed to report everything about your trips on August 1st, and then you start to prepare for that. So that's what we do. So we use the announce in advance technique. That's what we use uh, for the National Household Travel Survey. So uh, we announce beforehand which would be the travel day for which a trip should be reported. Responses, you can have nominal scale, ordinal scale, interval scale, and ratio scale. For example, you can say um, select, um, we, we do a lot of this. These are choices, because these are easy to um, understand. Uh, or rank ordering, for example, we say uh, which mode of travel um, is uh, are most similar with respect to comfort, indicated the most similar mode by putting the identification letter in the first set of brackets under the name of each of these modes. For example, um, I would say that bicycle and motorcycle are similar, automobile is not similar, and so on. Yeah, the, we do a lot of this. The, a lot of questions from NHTS are in category scale, for example, uh, get a seat, for example, in the use of public transportation, which is very important. Get a seat is extremely important uh, for in a scale from one to um, um, extremely unimportant, should be here. And so you get, so get a seat, low waiting time, low door to door travel time, and low fare. So if this low fare is very important, I will say this. Uh, seats is somewhat important, and so on. This is about attitude. Likert scale uh, consists of a number of attitudinal statement of, um, so the respondents rates each statement along a five dimension, um, denoted by strongly disagree, disagree, answer 10, agree, and strongly agree. Um, for example, uh, this is the same kind of uh, pro, um, the same as before, but instead of giving a, a rank, we give a, a Likert scale. So uh, it, get a C is um, important. So undecided, disagree or agree. This is also semantic scale. So uh, you can cross at any point in this line in order to um, see um, how important is for you get the seeds, waiting time, travel time, door to door, and low fare. So this is a way to report. This has been prepared by my student, Alice, uh, for one of the class that uh, she gave. 
So I want to give you an idea about um, National Household Travel Survey, uh, what peop why people are collecting this, why it is important, and what you can learn out of this. So you see that um, so the National Household Travel Survey in the United States um, has been out there for 40 years. And we they have done this how many times? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. So you see that it happens at uh, every six, seven, eight years. So eight years here, six years, seven years, five years, and um, now between 2001 and 2009, they were eight years. Now they are saying that they want to do it every five years. Uh, let's see if this uh, will happen. Um, so you see, this is the sample size. So they started with a very low number of households in uh, 69. So from 59, from 50,000, they jumped to uh, 150,000 households in 2009. So mainly this is due from the fact that they have been able to engage states. So states, they have the possibility to say, uh, I want add-ons because um, you know, if you have just 15,000, for, um, for many states, you have a very low number of observation. So given that now every state has their own um, transportation uh, model, they, they need to have more data if they want to calibrate a statewide transportation model. So in order to do that, they need to have add-ons. Uh, and in particular, uh, all these states participating, they are giving money to the federal governments and they are getting data. Back, right? For them, it's a cheaper way to collect data if they don't need to start from scratch. They can use the national framework in order to collect data uh, for their own uh, modeling effort. So uh, um, um, you see that they were quite successful this time because uh, many states decided to give money and collect their own data. Now, Maryland, they have add-ons in 2001, but unfortunately this time we don't have any add-ons data. So we have very few data for Maryland. I think in total we have 300 households for the entire Maryland, which is nothing. Anyway, um, no comment. Uh, but Virginia, they collect add-ons data. I, I think they have about 6,000 uh, households, which is a very good. Uh, so it means that in the next five or 10 years, they have a lot of information uh, to build their own model, uh, while Maryland, they have nothing. Uh, and in fact, they have just hired these students, the Virginia DOT, in order to analyze this data and in order to use that data for modeling, right? They have a vision in mind. So that's why they collected all that data. But anyway, this is the evolution. Um, so, uh, in, well, this is the way it evolved over time, right? So they started with a very short questionnaire. It was a face-to-face -face home interviews using pencil and paper questionnaire. And they mainly asked about shopping trips and um, business, uh, shopping trips and, uh, you know, commute travel. So, you know, in 69, they didn't want the detail about all the travel patterns. They were interested mainly in commuting and shopping because the other activities were kind of limited. Now, this is not enough anymore. And so um, after that, um, they switched to the National Travel Survey. So they, tra they started to collect information about motor vehicles and the location of miles to urban and rural travel. Uh, and they had a lengthy and detailed questionnaire including stop and long distance trips. So you see the way this has evolved from just shopping trips and commute trips to, um, uh, to having something on vehicles trips and location of urban and rural travel and uh, stops and long distance trips. Now, I will anticipate you that there is a strong debate about in the US about these long distance trips. First of all, the definition of long distance. What is a long distance trip in the US? You know, people in the US commute up to uh, 100 miles every day to go to work. So what is um, long distance trips? And in the meantime, given that they were not able to solve that debate, we have no information about long distance trips. So the result is that uh, we have nothing about long distance trips while uh, 
in the in Belgium we collected the information about daily trips and long distance trips at the same time. So, um, but in Belgium we reached an agreement. It seems that now in the states, long distance trips should not be, the definition should not be based on distance, but should be, should be based on uh, the frequency of that trip. Because, for example, a trip of 100 miles. Uh, made on a regular basis is not a long distance trip because it's your commuting. But for example, a trip of 100 miles to visit a relative uh, by car, this can be a long distance trip because it, it only happens uh, uh, once every couple of months. So it seems now that this is uh, the, um, the way we are going, but we, it's not clear when we are going to collect that data. And, and you see that this is very important for um, origin destination matrices for uh, uh, plane um, uh, trips and so on. So we have no information about this. So at that time it was based on, based on miles, but we are not happy anymore about this definition. So um, in '83 they started to have vehicle characteristic collected. Remember that uh, household travel surveys collects data about household individuals and vehicles. So you have everything about household, everything about individuals, everything about trips, and everything about vehicles. So this in 83 when is where when they started to collect information about vehicles. That's why I can have these wonderful car ownership models, is because there is everything there about vehicles of the household. Um, designed to collect travel period and travel day trips occurring on the same data, so they started to collect the travel patterns, not just uh, shopping and commute uh, trips, but everything about travel patterns. Um, the problem was that in '83 they had a very small sample, and uh, this created issues in. Um, you remember I said that this should be repeatable and comparable, and this was too small. So they realized, they realized that they needed to have more in order to have um, a good sample. Uh, in, 19, in the 90s, they started to have uh, the computer, computer-assisted telephone interviews. This is mainly what they are still doing now. So this technology is 20 years old. They started in the 90s and we are still using this, although now they want to change technology. They want better way to, um, to collect data, less expensive, more efficient, so they want to know from us. I don't know how many meetings I've seen in which they ask what should we be doing next. Uh, CAT is okay, but it's a 20 years old technology. Uh, they want to know about new technology, to way, new way to collect data. Um, so uh, uh, they also collect data on traffic accident. I didn't know that. So uh, if this happened within the past five years, and for the first time, they started to collect these add-ons. So they started to ask states to participate in this data collection effort. And so two states and one MPO, they gave money in order to collect data. And uh, I'm almost sure that one of the states was California. Um, so they always uh, are the ones who are uh, willing to um, uh, participate and get data. Um, so um, uh, so they, uh, they started to have a travel diary implemented. Um, trip rates increased considerably uh, with the introduction of travel diary because all the trips they were recorded, all even the small trips they were recorded. So they had an, incre an, an increased um, number of um, trips recorded, 50% um, or more. Um, uh, they, they gave a cash incentive. I don't know if they are, um, um, and they had odometer readings collected. This is 95, 2001. Um, this is the long trip survey was combined. So they, we had the data about long trip surveys combined with daily trip. We are not doing this anymore. Um, threshold for long trips, you see, just 50 miles. Um, so this definition is strange. But anyway, that's what they did at the time. Um, um, Walking trips were increased considerably because of the multiple prompts in the questionnaire, cash incentive, 
was both used in printed viewing and um, when the, the travel diary was mailed back um, and multiple data collection method for odometers and Okay, so 2009, you see that 20 add-ons, so it means that 20 states participated into the NHTS data collection. We have geocoding, this is very, very good. Uh, all the add-ons, they have geocoding. So it means that you know precisely where these people are located and where it, precisely where they go. So, and you get this with the data. So you don't need to, any, to do any geocoding. You get that, that from the states. Uh, and my students is using this. Um, it's very nice. Also, they, you see, they are looking for new technology. So a small sample of the household uh, travel survey was collected with cell phone. So they were able to record uh, location during the cell phone. So they had about 1,000, a little bit more than 1,000 collecting with the cell phone, but no data collection for long distance. So you see that this has evolved over time, that uh, what we are collecting is kind of different so I would say 2009 was very successful to have these add-ons. Making states participating was a very good result. Geocoding is wonderful because you can connect to this geocode all kinds of GIS information. Uh, experimenting with cell phone is very also very important. Maybe this is the future. Uh, but um, no data collection on long distance trips. So, you know, trade-off. Um, okay, so this is the kind of things that you can analyze uh, when you have um, longitudinal, well, when you have information over the years, right? This is 40 years of history of travel behavior in the United States. So we can have, uh, we have information about vehicles, um, drivers, workers, households, um, and persons. So um, you see how the, the number of vehicles per household is evolving over time, the number of drivers is evolving, the number of workers that is kind of declining because there are no jobs, many people unemployed, uh, the number of person in the household, you know, it's flattering here, it means that there are a lot of one person households, there are no many kids, people are aging. So you have all kinds of um, information about this and, and the evolution of this. So it gives you trends, and it gives you um, changes in travel behavior over the times. Um, um, so what's, what do we have in 2009 in HTS? So we have 100, over 150,000 completed households. We have a micro data set. It means that we have records of each interview but you cannot identify the specific person or household. So we have a very important problem about privacy. So you, you get the data about everything, but you, you, um, they don't want you to identify who is that person, right? You don't want to be able to trace exactly the person. Uh, so we have four um, hierarchical files to facilitate analysis. It means that you have Maybe you get four files out of this. You get an household files with all the household characteristics. You get an individual files with all the characteristics of the individuals. You get a trip files with all the characteristics of the trips. And you get a vehicles file characteristics. Um, so the data are available for download, free of charge. You can also download this and work with this. Anybody in the world has access to this NHTS. And, um, and the, you know, it's, it's very well organized, very well, well documented for now, not very well documented because this is a continuous work. They are adding information and documentation to all um, the, to the National Household Travel Survey. Uh, um, so these are, um, uh, what is new? Right, so um, so you have, um, for example, uh, you have uh, information about safety to school. Uh, it was never asked before, uh, so they are interested in the trip to school. They, this is extremely important now in the U.S. for a number of things, because they want to train students to uh, walk to school or to bike to school, 
or to take the bus. They don't want parents to drive the kids to school anymore. They are concerned about obesity. They want uh, active kids. So, and they want to know if the routes to school are safe or not. So all this kind of, so they want to enhance the understanding of how children travel to school and the safety that is a major concern for their parents. I want just to um, uh, tell you this anecdote. When we arrived in the States, I was not at home traveling around the world, so my husband was at home and uh, my daughter was six. So he sent the daughter uh, to the school by herself. So she was six, walking to school. It was about two kilometers. So we got a telephone call from the police, and the police <laughs> said, oh, there is a young girl. This is your daughter. You know, this is not allowed in the United <laughs> States. So kids um, uh, younger than nine years old, they cannot walk by themselves to school. So you know, all this, this is a policy. If we want kids, and my husband, he said, you know, I'm Dutch. Uh, I worked to school by myself since I was six years old. So you, you see, this is kind of um, things. Uh, they were also asking about hybrid vehicles. So they wanted to know uh, if um, um, they, there are there are hybrid or alternative fuel vehicles in the in the household since 2002, and they want to improve their understanding of personal transportation data. Uh, related to hybrid or um, alternative fuel use. So we know that in Maryland, uh, I think nobody says that there was an electric car, although there were some hybrid vehicles in the fleet. So you start to see the percentage of these hybrid vehicles in the United States, it's kind of becoming kind of significant. So you can see that from the National Household Travel Survey. Um, there were a lot of um, a question about employment. Um, so there were um, uh, instructions were added in order to report uh, accurately the distance from home to the workplace. Uh, and th this is important because they want to know if this work distance is increasing or decreasing in the United States. They would like to have people living closer to their work um, uh, place. And so that's why they wanted this. Um, and they, you see that also, this is also very important. They want respondents to report um, start time of your work activity. Um, if you have flexible working time activities, because flexibility is maybe something that is going to affect travel behavior in the future. Uh, if working from home is uh, an option, telecommuting, for example, uh, and how often you work from home, right? So this gives you an indication of how many times you go to work with your car, or how many times you stay at home and you work at home. For example, in my case, usually I, start, I try to stay at home at least one day per week. So uh, my husband stays at work every day. I uh, stay at home every day. He, doesn't, he just works from home. So all this question um, helps to improve our understanding of changing in travel pattern and changing, uh, changes in uh, work trips. Um, uh, there was also question about internet use. Um, so, um, or if you make purchases uh, through internet, so it means that if you buy through internet, which is a huge market in the United States, you make less trips to the shopping malls, right? So this is kind of um, um, trade-off uh, between um, out of home and uh, in home activity. So improving understanding of uh, e-commerce and internet impacts on the trip making. For vehicles, uh, when they collect information about vehicles, a very important information is uh, the mileage traveled, right? Remember my mother was predicting uh, how many cars, which type of cars and how old they are, and mileage. But it's very difficult. If I ask you how many miles you traveled um, last year, you know. It, nobody knows, right? You have a, a sense of how many miles, but we want to uh, calculate exactly this, especially if we want to make a calculation on greenhouse gas emission. That's why they have odometer readings. And actually, this was one of the questions um, of my students when she presented the results. So which mileage are you using? Because there are different types of mileage, and uh, we trust different, different data in a different way. So, um, there, so there is this odometer readings that is increasing um, the reliability of the mileage traveled um, 
uh, during the year. Geocoding, um, extensive use of geocoding, so it means that uh, you have you can connect this with um, land use data and do all kinds of um, analysis on land use data. Um, this is weight weighting uh, that was done um, uh, with very nice um, uh, techniques. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, they have enhanced the estimation of weight uh, for uh, kind of, for any kind of transportation measures. So this is what is new in the 2009 NHTS. Okay, so now let's see at what kind of, when you read this data, so when you open an household, um, um, and I would say my students usually they are very expert in this, that's what my, why my student was hired at Virginia DOT, because she knew, she knew both about data and she knew about modeling. And really, she knows by heart um, the National Household Travel Service. So when you open the household data file, which kind of information you have? You have the number of people in the household, and also by age. For example, you know that there are two adults, uh, three kids, for example. How old the kids are, uh, because all this uh, has an impact on the behavior of the household, right? If you have very young kids, it's different from having uh, teenage kids and so on. You know the number of drivers, you know the number of workers, and you know the number of vehicles in the household. You also know the income, the housing type, for example, if you have uh, a, uh, an apartment or if you have a townhouse or if you have a single house, if it's owned or rented. Uh, the number of cell phones, how many cell phones, uh, the number of other phones, the race of reference person, for example, if you are Hispanic, if you are Asian, all this is important because we want to know how new immigrants are behaving, for example, uh, Asian tends to own less car, to drive less, but they adapt and they adapt to the American life quite quickly. After five years, they act like Americans. So they have two cars, they drive everywhere, and then they eat junk food. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for example, if you are, and in, and in particular, if they are Hispanics, the block group characteristic, I don't know what it is, and internet use and delivery to households. So if you are doing a lot of e-commerce stuff and so on. So this is household, so all the information on the household. For each person, you know, age, gender, and the relation to the reference person. For example, if you are the head of the household, or if you are the other one. Driver status, if you have a license, uh, if you work full-time, part-time, and which is the primary activity that you do. If you use internet, if you use um, home deliveries from internet shoppings, at, uh, shoppings. if you have travel disability, uh, if, you are, if your disability affects your mobility, the education level, if you are an immigrant and from how long you, you are in the States, uh, some perception on the transportation, annual miles driven, you see this is very important. Um, if you have used public transportation for public transit, this is the variable that we were, we were using in car ownership, remember? There was a question saying, what about transit? So we were using that variable uh, to use, uh, to uh, quantify the use of public transportation. Unfortunately, as I said, 97% of the people in my sample say never use public transportation in the last, um, in the past month. Use of motorcycle, uh, walking and biking in, um, in the past weeks, and um, school travel, especially for children. So this is all kinds of information you have in the, in the uh, person file. Uh, for each worker, you, you know if it is a full-time or part-time, if they have more than one job, people in the United States, they tend to have more than one job. So work, for example, at day and work at night, especially if you are low-income household, uh, you have multiple jobs because they don't pay much. So you need to have multiple jobs in order to survive. So you need to know where the uh, workplace is located, uh, how they travel to work, if they drive alone or carpool, the distance to work, the usual time uh, to work, so this is kind of departure time and arrival time, if you work from work, uh, if you have a uh, usual arrival time at work, and what is the flexibility. So this gives you, a, well, this is one day, right? We collect information about just one day. But if we have this information, you know about variability in travel time. For example, 
uh, one day I needed to be at work at 8, but for example, next day I, or Friday, sometimes you have more flexibility, you can arrive, say, by 10 and so on. So this kind of flexibility is becoming more and more common. Um, I would say in the United States it's starting, but in Europe it's already reality. People have a lot of flexibility in working hours. This is vehicle, you know, all the information I got in my model for, for the um, uh, comprehensive model is from here, right? I, I know the make, the model, and the age of the car. This is my model uh, type and vintage, right? I get this from here. Make, model, and age. This is very important. Annual miles driven, this is from the odometer, right? How many miles I travel. If I have commercial license vehicles, how long I've owned that vehicle, so I have the odometer reading, if it is uh, an alternative fuel vehicle, and if I'm the primary driver. This is, for example, for you say, uh, in the household, there is usually here in, in, tai in Taiwan, there is one car. So who is the primary driver of that car? And if I have one car, and I have multiple uh, workers in my household, it's possible that the other one is either carpooling with me or using public transportation. So that's the kind of analysis you can do with that. Um, trips, right? So we said household, individuals, or persons, vehicles, and trips. So this is the most important part. Um, so I have um, origin and destination addresses. I have geocoded addresses here. Um, time, uh, start time and end time for each trip. Distance. Means of transportation, it means um, vehicle type, if it is a household vehicle and which one. So that is used by uh, who, right? So you really know who is using which car. Um, and if you, are choose, uh, if you uh, use transit, you have a wait time. Oh, this is good, I didn't know that. <laughs> because usually uh, you don't know anything about waiting time, access time, and, and ingress time. This is good to know that they have added this, because usually you derive this from other models. For example, from uh, an assignment model for public transportation. So you derive this later on. While this is clearly stated, I'm waiting the how much time and ac access and ingress mode to transit. If you use interstate, because now they are tolling the interstate. You know, I told you that in Maryland we uh, have constructed a new intercounty uh, interstate, and it's tolled. So, if you are using that and the toll you pay, this is also I didn't know that. <laughs> so the, I'm learning from you, my students. She knows everything about household travel survey, trip purpose. So if it is. Uh, uh, work, if it is shopping, if it is leisure, if it is eating out, and so on. A lot of detail. A lot of detail. So you can have uh, up to 20 different purposes. For example, shopping, uh, long term shopping. So if you are uh, buying for furniture, or if you are shopping for uh, clothes, or if you are shopping for food, which you do more frequently, right? So you have different category of shopping. Um, Travel part size, so it means um, how many people are traveling with you. And the last time of travel, for example, if you didn't travel that day because that you are sick, uh, which was last time that you traveled? What's behind the data set? Um, so uh, all civilian and non-institutional Institutionalized population in the United States are eligible for um, travel data collection. Uh, as I said, all these were interviewed, of which 1,254 with cell phone. Uh, okay, so NHTS is still conducted mainly as a telephone survey interview using computer assisted telephone uh, technology, so they are using CATI. Um, and the sample was extracted as a random digi digit dialing telephone number sample. You see that they are very much dependent on these uh, uh, telephone numbers. So if there is something, so if many people are switching um, to um, cell phone, then this is going to be wrong. So again, it's a telephone survey, it's what we have seen this morning, assisted with computer, so it's CATI, and the sample was drawn randomly from 
um, random digit dialing telephone number sample. Right, so this is the way you, you see how, what I was telling you this morning is applied for NHTS. Um, um, so some households are first contacted by an advance letter, so they announce the survey. They say, you know, uh, that's what we did also in Belgium. We announce the survey. We say, uh, dear household, you have been um, uh, sampled to, and uh, we are going to send you um, a questionnaire. Uh, so, um, um, and uh, we say, we are co uh, you are, um, a week later, the, they will get a telephone call. And in that letter, with the NHTS program manager, there is a letter announcing officially that uh, a survey is coming. A $5 cash incentive, $5 is not much, but anyway, better than nothing. And a brochure introducing the survey, so giving information about the type of question they needed to answer. Um, so when you um, recruit the, the interview, in the, in the recruitment uh, process, the CATI program also assigned a travel date to each household. So they will announce, so be prepared that for that day, you need to give us all the detail about your um, uh, trip, trips. So the interviews they revealed the travel date to the household in, in order to the, for the household to be prepared um, to record uh, all his um, trips. Uh, then the diary package uh, is emailed within uh, a day or two following the completion of the household recruitment interview. So uh, there is a letter from USDOT thanking the household for completing the household interview, a brochure describing the survey, a travel day diary, and a $2 cash incentive. So five plus two, we are already at seven. Uh, for each household uh, completing the survey, uh, the Riverside um, um, uh, provides guidance on how to complete the diary and included an example of the completed diary um, uh, and uh, a, a, a reminder card that states the travel date for which you needed to complete the survey and the odometer mileage from identifying the make, model and year of each household vehicle with spaces to enter the odometer readings and the dates they were taken. Right. Um, so before the day before, they received a telephone call saying that remember tomorrow is your day, uh, so be prepared. And um, and um, this call also verified that find out if the household received the diary package, uh, answer question, and remind household members to record their travel in the diary of the following day. So you see how many steps. Uh, they are behind, uh, so how many letters and how many people calling, so it's, it's a lot of work, so it's really a lot of work. Um, so um, then there is a seven day period during which interviewers are permitted by the CATI system to call the household to collect their travel details. So this is after, right? After the day of the survey, uh, the, the, in, the um, the, the CADI system gives you seven days in order to collect the information. So then um, the people in, at the CADI system, they call the, the household and um, uh, collect and uh, start to collect uh, the data. Um, so the, the survey is conducted over a 12 month period, so an entire year, different household over an entire year because they want to have a seasonal variation in travel. In travel. Uh, they, we say that traveling in summer is different than traveling in winter. Uh, there are holidays period we want to cover the entire year. So they, collect, they started to conduct um, uh, the survey in March 17. I don't know why we all started in the spring. Also in Belgium, we started in the spring and it continued until May 7, so it took a little bit more than 12 months. Um, so yeah, it, 13 months actually um, to, um, to collect the data. 
how to use the data. Now this is you. Uh, as I said, you can get this data. If you don't have data for Taiwan, you can use that data. So that's uh, uh, how my students has organized their uh, work. So you have household file uh, with household characteristics and household members. You have a person file. You know, you, you know the characteristic of each person, of the worker, the driver, and the customer satisfaction. You have the vehicle file, make, model, uh, year, annual miles, and odometer readings. And you have trips, daily trips, and their characteristics. So all this can be um, joined together because you have identification number. So here you have a household identification number. Here you have a household and the personal identification number, right? So with the first number, you can join this and this file. The, uh, then vehicle file, this contains the number of um, household and the number of vehicles. So you can connect this to this. And you can connect um, the trips because you have, for each household and for each person, uh, you have the, the list of trips. Right, so you can work um, and you can organize the data um, as you need. For example, for uh, our vehicle ownership, um, vehicle ownership model, we use history, right? We use household information, person information, and vehicle information. We don't use uh, trips for now. Uh, but if you if you do if you need to do more choice or departure time, then what you will use is household person and travel agents, right? So you you have, for each type of analysis you can use the data that you need. Um, uh, yeah, she she has um, identity. Yeah, that's what I say, right? Household identification number, household and person, household and vehicles and also person and trip identification. Uh, well, there is a data dictionary, um, given that all the people, uh, many people need to use the data, they have very good explanation for what is there. There is a code book, so this is, these are big books, are pages and pages of instruction and coding and recording. Um, so um, you, you need to know where information is stored, how to read the data. Uh, these are thousands of columns of variables. So you need to know how these variables are coded, where to find the, the information. Uh, for example, you see that um, um, for each column, you have a description of the content and an example. Um, so for example, the name, the name of the variables, with the variable type that can be a char character or numeric, uh, variable length, how many digit, uh, the variable label, um, short description of the variables, question number, because you want to be able to retry where this information comes from, right? If for example, uh, how many vehicles in your household you want to see a matching between the answer and how the question was asked, right? So this was question number C8, for example, number of vehicles in the household. Value range and codes, for example, uh, the answer can be uh, yes or no, uh, skip, refuse to answer, don't know, um, not, not possible, it was not possible to ascertain that question. Then um, unweighted frequencies um, show the number of records in the file for each listed value. Weighted frequencies, um, so how many times point one was recorded, how many times point two was recorded, how many times minus one was recorded, and so on. So the list of frequencies in the in the in the in the file. Uh, the ID numbers are eight digit for the household, two digit for the person number, two digit for the vehicle numbers, and two digit for the trip numbers. So you need how many digit uh, for the identification. Uh, these are the linkages. How you can link uh, the different files with uh, the the key variables. Uh, all right. Oh. So you see how it is organized. For example, suppose that this is 
an eight-digit num digit number for the household, right? So you have each household has an eight-digit uh, number to, for its identification. Then, if um, uh, so, if you have two person, what happens is that zero, so for the first person you add to the this eight digit zero one. So the identification of the person becomes the household, and then zero one. For the second person is the number of the household plus zero two, right? Then, um, then you have trip numbers, right? These are this is another two digit number. So uh, the the trip identification number, for example, is this, which is the household identification numbers plus the person identification numbers plus the trip identification numbers. So if household one as four trips, you will have 0101, then 0102, 0103, 0104, right? And you know that this, this household, the person number one of this household, and the four trips of this household. Um, some numbers, so how we are using this, uh, some basic statistics, these are also delivered by people at the Federal Higher Administration. Um, okay. I think this is quite interesting. Look at this. So, person per household from 69 to 2009. Uh, declining, right? From 3.2 to 2.5. So, it means uh, more single person in the household, less kids. So, this is the way the society is evolving in the United States. Vehicle per household, uh, again, from 1.16 to 1.86, so almost double. In 40 years, the number of cars per household has almost doubled in the United States. What is interesting is that over the past 50, well, you see that for the first time, we have seen a decline, a small decline or stable. Uh, we say that this decline is due to the crisis of 2008. But we expect this number to be stable um, in the next five or 10 years. That's what we say, we, but we never know. Uh, license per household, um, you see that this is also very stable. I would say that this variable has reached the saturation. This will be stay stable. Uh, vehicle per license, so it's one, right? For each licensed uh, person in the household, there is one um, uh, vehicle and maybe here is 0.5, right? Uh, work is per household, mm. um, again, we are not doing very well, jobs are not increasing, so it's 1.3, and vehicles per workers, is these two numbers are equal, so each worker has a car in the United States. No, no, there is no, no, no escape. Regions. Um, Across region, actually, this is also something that I found also in Europe, there is not much variability. You know, in this that are grown up societies, nothing is changing. Travel patterns are quite similar across regions. Travel patterns are all this variable. See, there is not much variable. Um, uh, not much variability. There is, there is nothing that is changing. And, uh, and I found this also in Europe. You know, travel patterns in France are very similar to travel pattern in England and travel pattern in Germany. Some exception, like French people, they go out for lunch, but that's it. Um, daily person trips. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Uh, the, here there is a magic number. We say that this, uh, um, you need to get something around 3.5, 4 trips per person, per day. That's, that's the, that means, if you have this number, it means that your survey worked or not. For example, in Belgium, we obtained three trips per uh, person per day, and we knew that this was low. So we, we, something went wrong when we collected data, and I know what went wrong. Many people said uh, that they didn't do, and they didn't have any trip. So they said, I didn't go out but this was a failure of the survey. These people actually did something, they just were too lazy to report the trips. So 
Uh, and you see here, it works much better because we have these numbers. You see, it's, it's around four, I would say. Um, now here, remember that um, the, the, the survey method collection was different, so they, were, they had many uh, less short trips. So the way, I think from starting from here, they had a travel diary implemented. So travel diaries allows you to uh, collect data about all trips, even small trips. So here, what you see here is not that, well, it's both a combination of the way they collect the data and the fact that we are, we are more mobile, we make more trips. It's both combination. Uh, PMT, um, person mile traveled, uh, daily vehicle trips, uh, not surprising, many of these are by car, right? Uh, this is the United States. Uh, daily vehicle miles traveled, again, uh, you see a decrease in 2009 with respect to 2001, and this is the 2008 crisis. I, I told you that 2008, uh, the, 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 the fuel price doubled, and you see that there is an effect, right? It's a small effect, but there is an effect. Um, uh, this is household daily trips. Um, you know, these are also used in um, the trips generation model. You can calibrate the um, um, trip generation model that are very important based on that, based on household characteristics. So you can use this for all kinds of statewide transportation model. Um, length, trip length. Um, Average trip length, so it's about 10 miles per trip, right? So each trip is about 10 miles, but this is average. Uh, I would say that there are long trips, for example, commuting trips that are 20, 30 miles, and short trips like uh, trips to the shopping mall, which are a couple of miles. So this, is, this doesn't tell you much. Uh, Oh, this is vehicle ownership, given that my student is working on the vehicle ownership. Uh, this is how many vehicles per household over the years. Uh, you know, this will be very important in a society like Taiwan that is changing. You want to know how many cars they were, say, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, now, and in 5 years, in 10 years, and so on. So these are ideas for you when you work in agency. Um, so you see that in 69, 20% of the population had no cars. This is going down, this went down to 90%. So there are much less households without cars. So let's see two vehicles, two vehicles, um, two vehicles kind of becoming stable, uh, about 37%. Uh, three or more vehicles, hmm kind of still increasing, right? Um, our vehicle, our, so this is the same number we have seen before. What is this? Um, well, this is uh, again, um, travels, vehicle ownership and population density. Um, so this is density. What is this? Oh. So it means that the more dense, uh, so you see that uh, very low dense uh, places, they have very high vehicle ownership rate, right? So this is low density, uh, and this is high density. So in high density, there are uh, many more people with no cars and uh, with one or two cars. Uh, while in the very dispersed areas, Everybody, they, they all have a car, right? So this is density and car ownership. Um, uh, what is this? Uh, this is, uh, oh, which type of car? So you will see that still many people, they have a car. But let's, I want to show you, um, I want to show you, hmm. so, What's going on here? Sport utility increasing. Uh, van and, tra and pickup truck have also increased. 
um, electric vehicles, nothing. <laughs> so still nothing. And vehicle <coughs> age, uh, um, there is a tendency to own a very old vehicles. Uh, Ten years, you know, it starts to be an old vehicle, but um, people are keeping that vehicle. Uh, you see the confidence interval. Um, so this is uh, these are very low numbers. It means that these are very stable mean. So you can trust this value. They are very uh, there, there is not um, a lot of variance around the mean. Um, yeah, you see that the vehicles are aging in the United States, uh, and I say that I think this is because of uh, the fact that there are no new technology vehicle in the market. Uh, this is my guess. Um, oh, vehicle miles traveled, um, yeah, about, uh, in average it's about 10,000. But you travel more with new vehicles, right? This makes sense. You have a newer vehicle, you travel more with that vehicle, and less if it is a very old vehicle. In average it's 10,000 10, miles per vehicle. So this is my students, young one, um, and I think maybe I can, yeah, we have five minutes for questions. So this is the way I wanted to give you an idea of why we collected and uh, which kind of information we get out of this. Once you read this data, even for agencies, is is keeping the control of the behavior of the transportation system. Um, so that's what we do with that. Questions? Do you have any information regarding the non response rate? Uh, so yes, yes, there is a non response rate, but I have no idea how it is. Um, I know that the Belgium was very high. Uh, maybe close. I don't know the numbers, but yeah, you have, the, all, you have all kinds of uh, information like this. It's important because they uh, wait. Um, the, you know, all this is weighted, and uh, so they are certainly they, in the big book. There is that information. So, sample size you provided is including the number response sample. No, no, this is these are the valid responses. I think. This is, these are the valid records. I don't know how many people they contacted. I mean, uh, the the trade numbers you, you provided. These are yeah. These are the. Um, uh, this. this uh, this is the responses that we get. I don't know how many they collected, in, uh, they, they contacted in order to get this, but uh, this is the, fi the, sum the final sample size. I don't know. They, usually we say that in this kind of stuff with multiple reminder, maybe 60% response rate, but I'm not sure. Uh, this is a general, I, I don't know how much is, it's, it would be interesting to see how much they have. So, when you review a paper, what's the, do you have a minimal requirement for the sample a response rate? Because I have seen some papers published in, for example, the Part E, they only have like 20% response yeah. rate, but they get accepted. So, do you have any idea or any? No, uh, no. Um, we uh, we had uh, we we did a second preference survey. We had seven percent response rate. So no, uh, no. Usually nobody asks you that question. At least, no. well, when I have a very low number of respondents, you know, you can, uh, the, the 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 reviewers start to be difficult. They say, oh, this is low, blah blah. Uh, but it depends on what you are doing. Yes. How do you determine the categories uh, in the characteristic uh, cat category level data? I mean, if the categories is too general, it provides uh, negative information. So, um, so how do you determine uh, how many alternatives or the categories in that kind of data? Well, it depends on the purpose of uh, your stuff. For example, if you um, if you want to do a very general mode choice model, you can uh, just ask, uh, 
if they use can against transit. But if you want to be to go more into details, then you need to. If it is transit, then it is metro, tram, or train, uh, high speed train. And if you want to want more detail, what was the access mode? You see here they want to know the access mode to the transit because uh, because in the states this is a problem. Maybe the transit is there, but you have no way to access that transit. So it depends. Uh, for example, Papos now. Before it was uh, five or four categories. It was uh, shopping, leisure, uh, work, um, uh, education, and other. Now we want to know everything about these activities. We want to know if it is shopping at home, if it is shopping out of home, if it is shopping lo long distance, if it is shopping short distance. And so it depends. Uh, but when you do this, you kind of stay general. You kind of want to accommodate different <coughs> needs. Uh, if you have the freedom to collect your own data, then it's up to you. But uh, remember that the more questions you ask, the less people will respond. Yeah. And uh, but you know, PhD students are for free, but there is a limit on how much you can use PhD students. <laughs> okay. Other questions? I hope I give you some idea about how to use the data and when you get the numbers for the model that you have seen. All right. So it's 1 o'clock. Uh, uh, so tomorrow is taking preference. It should be the data that you can collect. This is collected after. So maybe uh, in uh, five or 10 years, when you are influential at the, uh, at the Taiwan administration, you have nothing like that, right? Here. We are separating. For example, we have maybe two years with the data. Uh, okay, so this might be an idea. 